What's going on, everybody? It's Tuesday, December 2nd. Market was up today. Like I told you yesterday, I thought I, I'm pretty sure yesterday's drop had to do with first of the month payments. And that's the big reserve addition into the banking system. You get sometimes we see these kind of disruptions when you have a big, remember the bilge pump. Remember back in the, in the spring, I, I did a whole bunch of videos on the bilge pump. You got a boat, all right? Boat's cruising along. Some big rogue wave comes along, dumps a whole bunch of water into the boat to the point where it could destabilize the boat or maybe even sink the boat. What happens? The bilge pumps kick in and they empty out the water. So the boat stays afloat and stable. So when you have these massive reserve additions that happen on the first of every month or like a quarterly interest payment or something like that, it's the system has to absorb that. That's massive amounts of new assets, reserves, dumped into the system in one day and it's a little bit disruptive, okay? So that, and I said that's temporary, we're gonna bounce back and we did. We have a December 15th tax payment coming up last year. I told you this yesterday. Last year was like 102 billion. And December 16th was the window to buy. That was the trough of the drawdown, the tax drain. I want to talk a little bit about this, uh, you know, because the, the Fed said yesterday it was done with its quantitative tightening. Tightening which is not really a tightening at all, just like a quantitative easing is not an easing. It's funny how the monetarists, they have a whole unique understanding of monetarism, which is completely backward and wrong, but it's so built into um, you know, the institutional way that they think about it, the way it's taught, the way it's talked about, the way people view it, the way the media reports it, but it's completely backward. MMT explains all this, but I'm going to explain this quantitative tightening. Uh, the end of the quantitative tightening. All right, that's what everyone's saying. Like, oh, party time, get your party hats. The tightening is over. And not really, folks. All of these operations, you have to just understand what they are. They're just a recomposition of the financial assets in the economy, all right? In the case of the tightening, uh, you know, what, what happens is the economy gets more securities and less reserves. And those securities, we're talking about treasury securities, they're tier one assets, tier one capital. It's the same thing as reserves. They just have a term, you know, 30 days, 60 days, two years, five years, and a coupon, an interest rate payment attached to it. And the easing is a recomposition in the other direction. You get more reserves and you get less securities. Nothing really changes in terms of like the financial balance of the system. You just have different assets. It's just, they're, just, they're just switching the assets, all right? But let's go a little bit, let me go a little bit deeper on the tightening, the tightening, all right? <laughs> what this really is, because what was happening during the tightening? The tightening was uh, the Fed had all these securities that it, it had on its balance sheet. And they were allowing those securities to mature and then roll off. In other words, they just, they matured and then they, they're, they're gone. They disappeared. So like, there was a subtraction on the balance sheet of the securities. And at the same time, there was a subtraction in the amount of reserves in the system, in the banking system, right? Double entry accounting, okay? One asset is deleted on one side and one liability, a Fed liability to reserves are deleted on the other side, all right? 
So that's been going on for like three years or something like that. A little bit more than three years when the Fed start, first started doing that in 2022, right? So all that happened was they reduced the level of reserves in the system, but the system got more securities, treasuries, which, like I said, it's a tier one capital. It's the highest quality collateral that exists in the world and plus it earns a higher interest rate. So in effect, what happened with this tightening was that the economy got more interest. So how is that a tightening? It's not a tightening. You see what I'm saying? They got everything backwards. So now they stopped that tightening. So what does that mean? It means that they're no longer going to be, um, you know, rolling off their uh, securities. They're not going to be draining out any more reserves, which means in effect, the banking system will start to receive more reserves. Okay. And here's where an interesting thing happens because reserves, like other assets, they need to be capitalized. They're still going to be getting uh, treasury securities. Reserves need to be capitalized. So as reserves start to build up, that, you know, absorbs bank capital. Okay. With, and, and bank capital, that is the criteria. That is the thing that determines things like loan creation, um, how much uh, uh, assets banks can hold, okay? So now reserves are going to start building back up in the system. And that, you know, like I said, reserves, they take up some capital. And so what we might see as a result of this end of the tightening is that we may see slower loan growth, Okay, that, that's my uh, prediction right there. I think we're going to see slower loan growth. Um, so it's not really a tightening when you think about it. Banks are going to be seeing an increase in reserve balances, okay, because they're not going to be deleted anymore from the Fed reducing its balance sheet. And so that's going to that's gonna absorb more bank capital. Now, you have to understand that most banks are, are very, very uh, well capitalized. In fact, they keep their capital ratios way higher than what the, you know, the regulatory agencies require, okay? Just because they don't want to get close to being out of compliance or anything like that, all right? So it's not necessarily a big deal, but I'm just telling you, it's not a tightening. I mean, it's not a, an, an easing. I think this is this is what it, how it's being viewed, okay, by these people, by all of these monetarist people, these zombies who don't understand. They're like, oh, they're ending the tightening, so this must be an easing. It's not an easing because now it's like you're turning on a faucet that has been shut, not even shut, it was a drain of reserves. Now you're turning on that faucet and more reserves are gonna be pouring into the system. And they have to be capitalized. So that might leave less for loans, maybe less for other assets, okay? So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens with this. And just like I predicted when the Fed started to raise interest rates and everybody was saying there's going to be a crash, there's going to be a calamity, there's going to be a collapse, it's going to, everything going to go down. And I said, no, -uh, that's not going to happen. I said, it's going to be the opposite because that's like a gigantic, that will end up to be like a gigantic fiscal expansion. And now all these people who back then were saying collapse, calamity, ba ba ba, depression. They're like, oh, look at how much the government is putting out in interest. Look at how much they're paying it. Yeah, fiscal expansion. They didn't understand that back then. They're not going to understand this. 
Where else do you get this stuff that people tell you this stuff? Nobody tells you this stuff but me. Nobody educates you on this stuff as I do. Nobody. Not one person out there in the universe. I come on here every day and I tell you this stuff. So that's what it is. So when you hear these people saying, oh, it's the end of the tightening. And if the implication is that that's a loosening, that's not a loosening. Okay? That's not a loosening. Because I just explained why. You turn it on the spigot, you're going to be putting more reserve assets into the system. Reserves need to be capitalized. Capitalized gets used up or spoken for, and so there's less that's available for other things like loans. If you call that an easing, but I don't, I don't know how your brain works. I really don't, because I don't see that as an easing. And it's not, it's not just that I don't see it, it's not, okay? <laughs> All right, everybody. I don't know, man. I want some action. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, I mean, things are, you know, going to get interesting. Let me just put it that way. We got things coming up. The tariff situation, net government transfers falling, leading flows are rising again. Uh, there are a lot of cross currents, okay? 2026, uh, new fiscal elements, you got an increase in Social Security, you got, I mean, <clears throat> a lot of things, all right? You got to be on top of it. Because this is not a day-to-day -day thing where, you know, even though I tell you guys, okay, yesterday we, it was down, don't worry about it, we're coming back up. By the way, have you? did you see Apple stock? Apple stock is just, it's flying up. And I've been buying Apple stock all during that period earlier this year when everybody was saying, oh, you know, Apple's finished and Apple's done. And, you know, these other companies are beating Apple at their own game with the AI and this and that. And the stock was like at 210 and stuff like that. It's at 280, 285. OK, and I'm telling you this right now. The same thing is going to happen with NVIDIA. They're selling NVIDIA, okay? And AI is overdone, and it's a bubble, and it's, it's a competition for NVIDIA, and Peter Thiel, he sold his NVIDIA stock. By the way, this Peter Thiel, he's heavily, heavily, heavily into this micro strategy, this company called Strategy Inc., which the stock is down like, I don't know, 60, 80%. This is this, is this guy, Michael Saylor, who loaded up on Bitcoin uh, leveraged. You know, he was uh, um, borrowing money to buy Bitcoin. So Peter Thiel, you know, a great um, venture capitalist. I don't know about his, his market assessment. We'll see. But I'm telling you this, what's happening to, what happened to Apple, where you had a great opportunity to buy it, you got that in NVIDIA right now. I've been buying this, this weakness spot that we had. It's wonderful. You know, the thing that, that makes me laugh, folks, so many people sell profits. Like, how do you sell profits? You know what I'm saying? That's the whole reason you should be going into the stock market, especially when you're talking about companies that are so far ahead as leaders in their industry, where their profits are blowing through the roof, where the CEO comes on and saying, you know, we can't even keep up with demand. Like, and people concoct, or the media, or these, these, these fake analysts, or whatever, or even Wall Street analysts, they concoct these irrational fake stories about how uh, that's going to end. That's just going to end. They got really no rationale or explanation for it. They're just telling you, oh, that's going to end. How do you sell profit? Warren Buffett, God bless him, he's like 95 years old, something like that. The, the most 
the wealthiest stock market player, investor, whatever, you know, he blows away. The biggest hedge fund guy doesn't even come close to him. Who, who would that be like? Ken Griffin, who basically is a front runner of stocks. That's his whole company, Citadel, all right? That's like insider trading, but it was, it was legal for him and those guys. Warren Buffett, he doesn't sell profits. Like he made a lot of his money on very common, boring, ordinary companies because of the profits that compound and add up. So you got so many people out there like, oh, we gotta sell, you gotta sell? And then, ha, you got people, you don't know how many people I just meet and they say to me, Mike, what about this stock? And I look it up, right? The company's losing money. Why are you giving it your money when it's losing money? If you had a friend or a relative who constantly lost money and he came to you to hit you up, would you be uh, falling over yourself, tripping over your feet to give that person money when he's constantly losing money? You know you're never going to get it back. Maybe as a philanthropy, maybe as... But like, I can't believe how many people, they're like, what about this stock? And the company's been losing money. And, lo and then a company that makes billions and billions and billions in profit, they're like, we got to sell this thing. Doesn't make any sense, but that's human behavior. That's what people do. I take their money. And you can too. Or you could be one of those people who just throw it away, who bet on, on losers and don't want to bet on winners because of some arbitrary thing that somebody says that the stock is too high. Do you understand that NVIDIA, the forward PE is something like 25 or 28? You know how cheap that stock is on a valuation basis? I mean, it's ridiculous. Ridiculous. Anyway, that's it for today. Thank you for watching my video. Please like and subscribe. I'm closing in on 11,000 freaking subscribers, man. I want to hit that. And don't forget to go to my website, pitbulleconomics.com and sign up for a 30-day free trial to MMT Trader. I'm psyched up tonight. See you guys. Bye.